In Pit Lane, proudly brought to you by Online Invent, websites, digital marketing, and custom software. Everybody and welcome once again to another edition of In Pit Lane coming to you from the RMITV studios here in the heart of Grand Prix City, Melbourne. Well, joining me at the big desk tonight, as per usual, is Craig Doc Latigo, but alongside us is the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Eugene Arocca, and he'll be uh, joining us for the whole show, and we'll be talking to Eugene in just a moment. Because of that, we're going to we've got a special sort of a bit of a change of format this week. If you're watching us on Channel 31 and you would like to see our regular news segment, you will be able to watch that on the In Pit Lane YouTube channel as part of our extended program, which you, where you will also see a bonus song from our special guest tonight, our musical guest. They are the Trauma Dolls. They're coming up a little bit later on in the program. But right now, let's get underway with the program. And Eugene, welcome back to In Pit Lane. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's a bit of a change from the last time I was at, uh, on Pit Lane. We've redecorated. Like we've Absolutely sensational. Just, very much. Uh, just state change of the, the art. curtains. Yeah, just change the curtains yeah. a bit. A bit and of there's, a, there's a separate is the second comp here. There is. Just, just, there, look at just you and I last time. I, I know. Yeah, it's, 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 become, it's, become a, it's become a big, 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 big production. production. Uh, well done. Doubled in price. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, when we when we first first met, it wasn't it wasn't that long after you, you know, took the job originally. And I remember one of the things that you know you, you said at the time. Something that was in my head is that you, you said one of the things you wanted to do was to improve the the relationship and the knowledge of the sport with with people in power, with politicians, with funding bodies and all the rest of it. Judging by what sort of you know what, what we've seen you know, fairly recently, uh, it looks like that, that has actually happened. How, how do you think that is going at the moment? Well I think we've come a long way from from when we were in two thousand and thirteen. And I think what's been really important is proving to government the economic power of motorsport. And so we commissioned an, an Ernst & Young report back in 2013 that came up at around about $4 billion of economic uh, output per annum. That gets the attention of government, and particularly in regional spaces. We redid that again in 2019, 2020, and it's up to about $8.6 billion. And this is an industry that's lost its manufacturing in terms of cars, Holden and Ford. So when you put that sort of, um, sort of uh, data in front of politicians, their eyes do light up. And it's no accident that we've seen a definite increase in funding, um, both for programs, for facilities and for venues over the last five to ten years. And you know, we were hopeful that the, the Victorian government was going to make an announcement about some future track development, uh, but I'm not at liberty to go any further than that, other than to say that we're very, very optimistic that we'll continue to get government support going forward. Just that, on that then, the New South Wales government's committed 4.6, was it, I think? In, uh, to, um, to, well, motorsport. you have to... And, and, and off in the last few but years. Yeah, well, I know Victoria committed about $4 million back in 2018 as part of their election promise. Mm. We're expecting to continue to get that sort of funding. We know that Queensland have also given us some money for our junior programs, Girls on Track, and the, um, the New South Wales government's recently announced um, some funding for uh, clubs in particular. Mm. We only last week got $92,000 from the Queensland government for esports. So we're, we're out there. We're certainly pitching a lot for grants, mm. but we're finding the governments are becoming a lot more receptive to the opportunities that motorsport brings. We do have a, an election coming up in, in the state of Victoria. How, how significant is it what happened in South Australia? I mean, you had an opposition who sort of, you know, ran very heavily on the fact that, you know, we're bringing the Adelaide 500 back to the streets of Adelaide. They were very successful. From the feedback you're getting, I mean, you know, what effect has that had on politicians? Do people suddenly realise, oh, hang on a second, um, people, do people are passionate about this and it can get us votes? It is in our DNA. And it, it was no doubt that motorsport going back 50, 60 years is part of what we are all accustomed to. We've spoken to the Premier of South Australia both when he was in opposition and when he became Premier, and he had no doubt that the Adelaide 500 return had a number of touch points. And did it win the election for them? He probably wouldn't say that. But was it important in some, some very key seats? 
Absolutely. And so the I think... The main thing is it didn't lose the election well, for it. Well, 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 Marshall was the only government that's really lost an election in COVID. So for Peter Malinowskis mm. to have done what he did, he does credit motorsport as being one of the factors, not the single biggest factor, but I think all governments around the country are now taking note of the power of motorsport, the event-driven elements it brings to the economy and the fact that it's in our DNA. And people love going to, going to motorsport events. Those affect... DNA evidence, it's, it's the infrastructure that delivers to society full stop over there as well though too. It, what it delivers to hospitality, to the whole tourism, everything doesn't it? it, it everyone forgets you like you spend a few dollars on an Australian Grand Prix, but what it provides Multiply. outsides and multiplies exponentially is incredible, isn't it? And I reckon we're all, we're all waiting with bated breath to see how 2022 goes. Like I've been to every Adelaide 500 since I started at Motorsport Australia except for one year when I tore my hamstring, couldn't get on a plane. Um, but and I'm really looking forward to going. They've got the Supercars Awards Night on the Monday night. They've got a gala night on the Friday night. They're, 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 putting, all, they're putting it all out there. And I'm hoping and expecting that it'll have the same impact um, in 2022 as the Grand Prix did at the start of this year when they had essentially record numbers of over 400,000 people. So I think that's a really good uh, litmus test for the sport to put on a big event, big numbers, and it'll let every other government say, well, we need more events in motorsport. Well, you mentioned the Grand Prix and also you know, coming out of the, the, the pandemic, uh, the effects of that. We'll find out more about that at the moment. We're going to take a break in just a moment here on Channel 31. Now, if you're watching on Channel 31, we'll be back with more from our special guest, the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Eugenia Rocker, right after this break. You're watching In Pit Lane. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Get the phone ringing for your business with website development and SEO services from Online Invent. Visit onlineinvent.com.au. And now for those of you watching on the Inpit Lane YouTube channel, it was a big weekend, particularly at Mount Panorama. Let's find out about it and what's been happening around the world of motorsport with the Inpit Lane Motorsport News. A huge weekend at Mount Panorama for the Bathurst International. Some wild weather, plenty of major announcements, and a new TCR champion was crowned. TCR boss Marcello Lotti was at Mount Panorama to make the announcement that Bathurst would be a part of the new TCR World Tour concept alongside a second Aussie round at a venue yet to be announced. For the next season, a TCR World Tour is a practically we selected nine events over the 300 events existing on TCR in the world. Clearly, we try to select the best nine events. And I have to say, the first announcement for the first one of these nine will be here in Bathurst next year with TCR Australia. I, I was here in, in Australia to see uh, Philip Ireland on, uh, in events. I have to say, also professional team are involved and young driver, what I love, talent drivers. And this will make our decision easily to say Australia have to be inside. But not only for one, like I told you before. But this is one, but will be two events. On track, Tony Delberto broke through for his first national championship, winning this year's TCR title. The Honda driver only needed to finish 12th in the final race and he just scraped in crossing the line in 11th place, which later became 10th thanks to a post-race penalty to Luke King. Dalberto's main rival for the championship, Will Brown, won the race but fell nine points short of defending his title. So I could see Will grabbing the lead and then getting back to second. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> how have we got to this point, you know? Um, but it's been a big journey for myself, Honda and Wall Racing. I had to convince Honda to get involved back in 2019 and I'm just so proud and thankful that we've delivered a championship for them. In Trans Am, Nathan Hearn returned from the US to take the win in the feature race from young Nash Morris and Brett Holdsworth. The win also gave Hearn the series championship. Stephen Johnson returned to the Touring Car Masters with a dominant performance. Johnson won both races on Sunday to sweep all four races, becoming the only driver to achieve the feat since the series introduced the four-race format in 2018. In the three-hour GT endurance race, Triple Eight's Brock Feeney and Prince Jeffrey Ibrahim drove their Mercedes to victory after a race-long battle with the Audi R8 of Tim Slade and Brad Schumacher. The Mercedes of Ross Palakis and Jordan Love was third. 
George Russell has broken through for his first Grand Prix win after an incident-packed Brazilian Grand Prix at Interlagos. Russell started from pole and led for most of the race, but behind him all sorts of chaos was taking place. Lewis Hamilton, Hamilton survived contact from arch rival Max Verstappen to finish second, with Ferrari's Carlos Sainz third after his teammate Charles Leclerc lost time after he was taken out by Lando Norris. Daniel Ricciardo's race ended on the first lap after he made contact with Kevin Magnussen. Ricciardo will now take a three-grid race pe uh, place penalty into the next race after stewards ruled that he was responsible yeah. for the crash. Alvaro Bautista has held off the challenge of reigning world superbike top rack Raz Gatlioglu and six-time champion Jonathan Ray to become the 2022 champion. A second place to Raz Gatlioglu in Indonesia last weekend was enough to clinch the title for the Spanish Ducati rider with only this weekend's final round of Philip Owen remaining. Meanwhile, over in the West, local driver Damien Harris in the Reposada Autosport Top Fuel Drags to beat Victorian Phil Lamartina to win the latest round of the Australian Top Fuel Championships at the Perth Motorplex. In top door slammer, the win went to Daniel Gregorini, who took a solo pass in the final after John Zappia was unable to front after he popped the blower in his round two win against Kelvin Lyle. On two wheels, the top fuel bike honours went to Benny Stevens. And as local drag racing is coming to the coming to an end, the it's of course coming just starting, the race season in the United States is just about wrapping up. This is the Inpit Lane International Wrap and news from NHRA. Austin Proc finished off his impressive late season run, winning over Antron Brown to take his third career victory. But it was Brittany Force who captured her second NHRA top fuel title after a win in the first round. Cruz Pedragon was dominant in Funny Car to win his first race of the year, but runner-up Ron Caps clinched the series title. Greg Anderson closed out 2022 with a win in Pro Stock over Erica Rendes in the final round, but it was Enders who took the championship. And Angie Smith won in Pro Stock Bike, but it was her husband, Matt, who went home with the series title. A conclusive 1-2 finish to Toyota in the eight hours of Bahrain, with the car of Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez winning the race. But it was Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley and Rio Hirakawa that took out the World Endurance Championship driver's title by finishing second, making it four consecutive titles for the Japanese manufacturer in the WEC. In LMP2, Sean Galale, Robert Frines and Rene Rast gave Team WRT its second consecutive WEC victory, while the Team Jota trio of Antonio Felix da Costa, Roberto Gonzalez and Will Stevens took out the LMP2 title. In the final hit-out for the GTE Pro Class, it was an historic win to the Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco and Miguel Molina. Alessandro Pierguidi and James Collado, also in a Ferrari, will go into the record books as the final GTE Pro World Champions. And the Team Project 1 Porsche, driven by Matteo Carioli, Nicky Leitweiler and Mikel Pedersen, claimed their first win of the 2022 season in GTE AM. But the title went to the Aston Martin team of Ben Keating and Enric Chavez. And it was an encouraging start to the international career of Aussie Porsche racer Henry Jones. The 2022 Carrera Cup Australia champion charged through the field to claim a well-deserved second place in his first international meeting. That's the In Pit Lane news for this week. We'll have more news for you next week. When we come back, we'll be joined once again by a special guest, the CEO of, the, of Motorsport Australia. Here's Eugene Rocker. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In Pit Lane here on Channel 31. Our guest this week is the CEO of Motorsport Australia, Eugene Arocca. And Eugene, before the break, we were talking about sort of the effect of motorsport on the on the local economy and that sort of uh, that, that sort of thing, and the, the government getting involved. Of course, the the big event in Australia is the Australian Grand Prix. I was rather surprised to see the extension that was given to the Grand Prix, but not only that, the, the big news was we're also going to get not just the Grand Prix, but now we're getting Formula 2 
and Formula 3, and we've got some young Australians involved in those categories as well. I mean, how significant is it to get those categories out here as well and also to extend the contract by, by such a long period of time? Um, two things. Probably one is not that well known, but during the Grand Prix, we hosted at Lamaro's Hotel about 24 of the heaviest hitters in motorsport in Australia. We had Stefano there, we had supercars there, we had the Australian Grand Prix, we had government there. And so the 20, 20 odd people it was in the room hosted by Motorsport Australia. The first time we've done anything that big in terms of the key players in the sport. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that shortly after that function, we'll call it, um, the, motor, you know, the government was able to put away a 10 year deal. I think the F1 uh, management love Australia. They love Albert Park, they love the history of the place and they love the, the fact that when they come to Australia, particularly if it's a first race, we set a really good agenda for the rest of the year. So there's no doubt that they love, they love um, Melbourne and, and Victoria. I was surprised because I know New South Wales threw a lot of money, mm. more than we ended up having to pay yeah. to get the Grand Prix and you can see how bitter the Premier was after it was found out that they weren't going to get it. Um, but I, I think it's, a, it's a, an extension built on trust and the relationship with the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, with Motorsport Australia, has been able to build over 35 years and more recently. I so that's the, a good the, thing. The body language from the New South Wales was pretty. Oh, nice, they were pretty. Wasn't they were pretty. Wasn't just to a, put it bluntly, they were pretty. It wasn't yeah. just a press statement. It was yeah. a body language, oh, wasn't it? Exactly. They were filthy because they put a lot of money on the on the table. They flew people over to London. Oh. They rolled it all. They lobbied it big. And lobbied hard, and yeah. so they missed out. Um, and that's our good luck in Melbourne yeah. and in Victoria. Um, but I do think the addition of the twos and the threes, the Formula 2 and the Formula 3 races, is going to add uh, an extra dimension and it's going to put supercars in an interesting position because they're going to be pushed down the, the pits, if you want to call it that. Just, so there's some logistical work to be done in that space. Just a question on that, though. As you said, you're lobbying or whatever, you're throwing your money, etc. like that. Without giving away too many trade secrets, there must be a little bit more to it. I mean, you, you must be... Show, showcasing what, what your plans are and business plans and where you want to see the sport go in Australia and obviously having an input to the rest of the world. Because I know in the past we've had a lot of our uh, officials and, and flag marshals and etc. like that, the trains, and they, you've sent them overseas to be able to train up to half a dozen other circuits around the world to be able to lift them up to the level we have. And the other thing as well too, the Motorsport Centre of Excellence is one of your long-term goals as well, though, too. Yeah. You, you, I'm sure you've got a few other trade secrets you can't tell us. They all yeah. must be very important in, 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 obviously, getting those deals sealed. It's a very long question. But I think um, <laughs> uh, we're proud of the fact that we are recognised around the world as one of the better trainers in, official, in officialdom. And we've just brought back some people from Malaysia where we did some training. Ferrari have appointed us as their Development Academy um, host um, in the Asia Pacific region. We recently conducted that with 24 young people, including uh, girls, and uh, six Aussies were picked at the last uh, barrier and two went over to Maranello. Unfortunately, they weren't picked. And thirdly, um, the fact that we have such a great record from a safety point of view, generally speaking, sets a standard that most other countries really are envious of. So when you throw all that together and the fact that um, per capita prior to COVID, we had more licensed competitors than any other country in the world. That just, just adds another layer to the story. So it's our officials, it's our experience, it's our big event, um, our big event reputation. Uh, and if you look at the young drivers that are making their way overseas in Formula 2, Formula 3, we almost had a chance of two Aussies at Formula 1. Uh, that's obviously not going to happen with Daniel. When you look at that history over the last three to five years, we've really made a big impact on the world stage from young drivers to officials to events to Ferrari. And so I think that's a really good story and government see that. And we're hoping to host the Ferrari Academy in Australia at some stage. We did it in Malaysia at Sepang. Hopefully it'll be in Australia in the very near future. And that's young drivers and their teams coming to Australia to compete, which is fantastic. You mentioned uh, the marshals there. I mean, we all know that the, the sport simply doesn't exist without the, without the marshals. But a lot of the feedback that, that we've been getting, and you know, we certainly when we, people knew that you were coming on, it was one of the things that people asked us to, to raise with you, is the fact that with all of these events happening around Australia, so many events happening everywhere, often in the same state on the same weekend, and the, the increased cost of especially things like travel and accommodation and all that, What's the situation with marshals at the moment? I mean, it's a real challenge at the moment, you know, getting that many people in. How do you attract more people and how do you make it more attractive for them to, to stay in the 
to stay in the, the sport when it's becoming so expensive for them to basically, you know, uh, they're not just giving their time anymore, they're, they're, they're putting their hand in their pocket and it's written down pretty deep. Brett, um, volunteerism generally in Australia is down. Um, Pre-COVID it was dipping and it, I think since COVID it's obviously dipped further because of a lack of events. So that's a, an Australia-wide trend. We only recently set up a working party with officials, both from outside of the organisation and also our staff, to come up with a number of pilot schemes to appeal more to the younger generation. And we're going to use the Grand Prix as a platform to do everything from QR codes at entry points near the spectator uh, entries to the venue to roving ambassadors speaking to people about, hey, do you want to get the best, house, best seat in the house? Do you know about Motor Australia, Motorsport Australia? Do you know where to go, to, where to start? So we're pulling together a lot of ideas. We're going to put some money behind it because we do and we are worried. We do see and we are worried by this trend about people not wanting to be available all weekend. Um, it's a pretty big commitment to go to Bathurst from Thursday to Monday or Sunday. And so it's a problem, it's a challenge, but we're looking at ways and we're going to invest money to recruit, reward and engage as much as we can, particularly with a new generation coming you mentioned, through. You mentioned also the number of, of, of licence holders we have in Australia. The point is, where do they race as well? I mean, when you have a look at the number of you know, yep. events that we have, and when you look at the situation in somewhere like New South Wales, which is like a huge state in terms track. of... And they've got one track at the moment. First of all, what is the situation, as far as you're aware, with Wakefield Park and its future? I'm Look, Wakefield is a venue that is really critical to that state. And it, it, it's just beggar's belief that the biggest state in the country has got essentially now one track which is impossible to get on. And you know the old saying that if you've got a clash between your wedding day and a race day, cancel your wedding because it's easier to reschedule than it would be to get back onto a track. And so we've lobbied the government directly. We know that there was a successful petition of more than 20,000 people. It's therefore going to be debated in Parliament. I'm still reasonably comfortable and com or confident that there'll be another play in this and that Wakefield will return. I think there's a bit of... Um, uh, we're certainly strong council support. There's a land ruling, a land court ruling that needs to be overcome. But I do think that there'll be an outcome that will hopefully result in, good, in a, good, a good outcome for motorsport. But we cannot allow New South Wales to continue with one track. And we actually challenged the Premier and said, you're prepared to put allegedly $100 million on the table per annum to get a Grand Prix. Why wouldn't you spend some of that mm. money developing tracks? Yeah. Well, we'll find out more about, uh, about the more involving motorsport in Australia in just a moment. We're going to take another break here on In Pit Lane. When we come back, not only will we be rejoined again by Eugenia Rocker, but you'll hear from our band, the Trauma Dolls. You're watching In Pit Lane. Don't go away. We'll be right back. OK, well, it's time now for a bonus song from our musical act tonight, The Trauma Dolls. They're a Melbourne band, and you can check out their music at Spotify, Apple Music, Facebook, Instagram, and, of course, on YouTube. They've also got a, a website, which is the uh, thetraumadolls.com, and they're releasing an EP at the end of 2022. But right now, they're going to uh, play us out, and if... Uh, if, if with, with, oh, they're going to play us as the first song for the night, and it is In My Name. So this is the tra Trauma Dolls and In My Name. Children, let them come unto thee. Oh, soft little children, let them come unto thee. Oh, a little out of context goes a really long way. A cult of misinterpretation brought in my name. Take me a break. I'm good as age, but I still wear my attention. Now, pay what you say. Everything I say with precision now, they're not okay. I'm coming back with a definition. Don't fret of me because I'm coming after thee. Oh, greedy little piggies, so much for your poverty. Take 
of electricity. Turn that into a felony. Then I said, turn the other cheek. I didn't mean by living the week. A daddy had a sadistic face, but if any would be a me. Hey, give me a break. I'm the good of those rights to the way it's my religion. Now, what they say. Distorting everything to say with precision now. They're not okay. I'm not coming back to the case of definition. Now, don't pray to me, because I'm coming after me. Give me a break. I'm a Jesus Age Christ to wear my religion. Nah, hear what you say. Starting everything to say. But since now, they're not okay. I'm coming back with a case of defamation. Nah, don't pray to me because I'm coming after me. Back to in pit lane. Well, Eugene Arocca, the uh, CEO of Motorsport Australia, is still with us. And uh, Eugene, how long have you been there? It's been ten years, has it yet? Yes, it's uh, ten years on the twenty sixth of October. It's only about a two week period. Uh, the president sent out an email and uh, congratulated me on ten years, and I've been reflected back that it's the second longest job I've held in a 40-odd year career, so I'm pretty proud of that. And that is saying something, because, I mean, before you started... It's a rotating uh, I think, I think uh, Doc and I were discussing before the... Paid before job, the program, paid job, because yeah. you did a... Before the program, I mean, that uh, yeah, the, the, the CEO of CAMS, or as it was then, uh, it wasn't a, a long-term position. How many did we have? We had, we had five in ten years. Five so in we ten had a bit years, of a bad run. they were all guests on the program. Yeah. You survived. Yeah, well, they sort of thought that I might be able to bump up the average. But even I, I even then, even now, I think the board was probably surprised that I've gone as long as I have. You've got to factor in we've had two and a half years of disruption because of COVID. So I sort of think I've really only done eight years because we were robbed of you know genuine events for two years. But... I've loved every minute of it. And I'm not a real mad motorsport fan. I love F1 and love supercars. But for me, it's about the people. It's about the staff. It's about the officials. It's about the competitors. And I've enjoyed every moment of it. And it's gone in the blink of an eye. It seemed only like yesterday, Brett, Brett that you and I were talking in the other studio. And it was nearly 10 years ago. Mm. I just wanted to say... Ten years of paid employment. You did do a lot of years at Collingwood as a, on pro bono. Yeah, as, I did. I did. Well, well, you so your homework. Pre, I did yeah. about for ten or eleven years as yeah. pro bono as a lawyer. Yeah. There, over a million dollars worth of legal work that I did for them when they had no money. Do you mm -hmm. believe Collingwood had no money back then? Mm -hmm. And then they ended up putting me on the board, and I ended up working in sports admin. That was really the start of me getting involved in sports administration. And so um, when I left North, there was a period of time when I didn't know what I was going to do, and. Luckily, I got a call from CAMS, as it was then, and they asked me whether I knew what CAMS was, and I happened to know what it was, and here I am 10 years later, a bit greyer, a bit older, a um, bit more tired, but otherwise really enjoyed the journey. And one thing that we, we have to ask you, we, as I said, we had the feedback from a number of viewers. One thing that somebody was very keen, a couple of people were very keen to talk about, was the situation involving, you know, away from circuits, particularly off-road racing and, and rallying in terms of a lot of off-road racing has moved over to the AASA. Uh, what's the situation with off-road racing at the moment and where does those sort of non-circuit events fit in with, with Motorsport Australia? Well, now? I mean, clearly we are a circuit-loving nation. We, we love our circuits and you know, from Brock and Moffat and all the champions we've had over the years, we've got a str very strong legacy in off-road and rally. We've got some great champions over the years. It's what you'd call a bit of a niche. I don't want to. I don't want to say very a niche part of our sport, but the numbers don't don't compare to the the, the circuit license numbers. That's all the more reason why the split between the AASA and Motorsport Australia off-road competitors is really you know hurtful. We are a sport that can't afford to be split between two different sanctioning bodies. Nonetheless, our off-road championship has been pretty strong over the last two or three years. 
they let, we let them do their stuff, we do our stuff. I think ultimately we always go back to what's good for the sport and I think to have a united sport is always really important. But rally and off-road are one of the, what you might call the specialised areas of our sport. Because being a rally, one thing I have learned is off-road and rally driving is a particular skill that doesn't necessarily translate easy for circuit drivers. So, you know, it's tough in Unless this... Unless you're showing Van Gisbergen. Unless you're, well, he's a, he's a rare all, exception. He's an absolutely Go exceptional fast, driver. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm often absolutely amazed by the skill of those rally drivers and off-roaders. It's pretty, it's pretty special. Just along those lines, Eugene, one question that's been raised and, and been touched on before by yourself and many others, the Australian Motorsport Council, what will that entail if it eventually gets together and, 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 well, and, and, and the, obviously the head honchos, not necessarily butting heads, but obviously trying to get together and get on one page. With well, we're actually things. meeting on the 17th. We're meeting on uh, Thursday. We're meeting this week for our annual general meeting. And I, I believe it's, um, it hasn't really got to where it really needs to be. It's supposed to be a united voice for all of the two and four wheeled sports. We've just brought Speedway back in. They'd, be, they'd been out of it for a while. So I think the opportunity is there for the Australian Motorsport Council to be more active mm -hmm. around tracks, around funding, around lobbying for motorsport generally. But motorsport's such a diverse wheelhouse. You know, there's two wheels, there's four wheels, there's off-road, there's rally, there's drags, there's speedway, there's circuit racing. But it's often very hard to corral us all together. But right now, the collegiate relationship between Peter Doyle at motor motorcycling, Kelvin at carving, Brett at Andra, uh, Darren recently appointed, Darren Tyndall at Speedway, um, and myself, it's really strong. We share information, we share policies. Currently, there's an insurance crisis, so we're talking about how premiums are being impacted by for world events. And so it's a really good genesis for what we believe to be a really great long-term um, sort of spokes body for yeah, our sport. That's great. Well, we certainly, there's, there's so much you've mentioned in I mean, there's just so much to talk about. But Eugene, thanks for coming in and joining us on tonight's program. We really do appreciate it. Best of luck for the, for the rest of this year and for the future. And uh, let's, uh, let's all hope for a, a better future ahead and a bright future for the sport of motor racing around Australia. But for now, Eugene Rocker, thank you for joining us in Pit Lane. Thanks, Brett and Doc, and I'll see you in 10 years' time. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. And I hope you'll join us next week for more on In Pit Lane. But right now to take us out is our band for this week, the Trauma Dolls. And you can catch them on Spotify, Apple Music, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all over the place. And they're releasing an EP at the end of 2022. But right now they're going to take us out with their song, Playing With The Big Boys. This is the Trauma Dolls. Good night.
you're gonna get ahead, but you ain't getting nowhere unless you can make something. Playing with the bad boy. Being a cog in the wheel, now it's time to go. Throwing his toys right out of the cock, he's a big man, but he's not. Big thing is a man. Man, 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 man